He was continually plagued by his next door neighbor asking to borrow things. Sometimes people ask to come and borrow, not borrow, but use my wood shop. And I said, well, don't get any blood on my machines. It's corrosive. But anyway, this guy, his neighbor's asking to borrow things all the time. One morning he saw the neighbor approaching his front door, so he was all ready for the guy. Can I borrow your power saw this morning? I asked the neighbor. Afraid not, Tom said gleefully, I'm using it all day. In that case, you won't be using your golf clubs. May I use them? <laughs> so they both had an idea to outfox each other. And Proverbs 22, 7 says this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Would you bow your heads with me? Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to bring these morsels from your word to the family in the house today. And we pray that the truth of your word will take hold of us and will cause us to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a small child, um, we used to go to visit my grandparents in Westfield, New York. We'd go for, their, for a week uh, in the summertime and then maybe before summers or another week. But um, one of the things I remember is my grandmother's hatchet. My grandmother had her own personal hatchet. My grandfather had a wood shop, plenty of tools down there, but for some reason she had her own personal hatchet. And I remember that thing. Um, and it was, they, the handle was longer than a normal hatchet. It was about like this, and it had a nice curve to it, but it also was crooked was, you know, if you've ever seen a, um, an ax that they used to hew square up beams, they have a bend to them so that when you chop, you won't uh, chop into your foot. But anyway, this hatchet was like that. And the only thing I ever saw her do with it was to use the back end of it for a hammer. And she would pound in carpet tacks with that hatchet. I can't remember seeing her do anything else with it. Maybe, maybe in their earlier life, she, they both came here from Sweden. They met and, and married here in this country, but maybe in their earlier, I think they got married in 1901 or 1900, and uh, Grandpa was a jobber in the woods. They cut, they cut uh, timber in the woods, and uh, she did the cooking for the guys in the lumber camps. Maybe she used it to chop kindling. I don't know the history of it, but... Um, this hatchet had a crooked handle. When she passed, I managed to get that hatchet. And I considered it quite a prize because it was my grandma's hatchet. And I replaced the crooked handle, but I was never able to get the new handle to stay on. There's a little trick to that. But the hatchet is a small axe, useful for cutting branches, twigs, kindling. You know, if you're camping, you need to chop a little firewood. A hatchet is a good tool to have, but it's not much use without the handle. This is an axe. Well, it's probably a hatchet head. It's a really old one. But um, it's not much use. I suppose you could just chop something by hand with it like that. And then there's this blunt end in the back that she used to use to, to do cart. This wasn't hers, by the way. I don't know what became of that one. It's buried somewhere in my cellar. So, but without the handle, it really doesn't do its work. It's uh, made out of steel. Um, most of them are sharp. This one is, I guess it would chop wood. And uh, that's what it's meant for, to cut or chop wood. Nowadays, a lot of hatchets have a fiberglass handle that's never gonna come off. But um, 
these older ones, if you didn't fasten that handle on correctly, there's a little slot in that hammer and you put a wooden wedge in there and that expands it. And then you put a, a metal wedge in to expand the wooden wedge this way. And that's how you get those to stay on. But with weather uh, expansion and shrinkage of the wood, sometimes they get loose. Well, the story, what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, I'll tell you. Second Kings chapter six is about an ax that came apart. The company of prophets, the sons of the prophets is called, uh, is called in the Hebrew. They, they found themselves in a structure that was too small for them. So in other words, the group must have been growing. And they, they wanted to, have to build a bigger place. So uh, the building was sort of a school. It may have been residential. They, it may have been a, a hut or some kind of a cabin. I really don't know what, but it, what it was. But um, it was a place where they gathered together to sit and listen to Elisha the prophet. And he was the one that picked up the mantle of Elijah when Elijah went up in a whirlwind and he got a double measure of the Spirit. In other words, the power of the Spirit of God was on him to do miracles and he did many of them. He was kind of famous for that. He was sort of a rock star of the day. But um, these people were drawn to listen to what he had to say. And in verse number one, the company of the prophet said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet you is too small for us. So he was the head fella, a number one, super duper, most chiefest of all the prophets at this time, associated with a lot of miracles in the Bible. And he had, as I said, retrieved the mantle when Elisha was taken up in a whirlwind. He was the leader. He was the teacher. He was a professor to these young prophets. And they respected his authority. And they were eager to, eager to learn from the master. So they had grown to the, so that the meeting place was too small for them. So verse 2 says, let's go to the Jordan where each of us can cut a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. So it seems here in verse number 2 that somebody had a plan. They had a plan. They weren't carpenters. They weren't, you know, woodcutters, but they had something of a plan to increase their place where they stayed. So uh, they needed some building material. Continuing in verse four, and he said, go. So Elisha uh, allowed them to do that. They asked him for permission and he said, go ahead. So he allowed them to go and do what they had planned to do, to cut down poles and build a building of some kind. I can't imagine what kind of building this was going to be. But it seems that these prophets were seeking his permission or at least his approval continue with their plan. Verse 3, then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? Revealing something of, of, of a hesitancy, uh, of a, of a self-doubt. We're not going to be able to do this without you. So lacking self-confidence, you know, maybe they doubted their ability to complete this task. They needed his guidance. They already had his permission. Now they needed him to go. They would do the work, but his presence would give them confidence. And he said, I will. So Elisha was a true leader. He understood that his leadership was valid. Um, to these young men. Not only that, it was vital to these young men. In verse 4, and he went with them, and they went to the Jordan and began to cut down some trees. The plan seemed to be coming together. 
at least they had an idea to acquire some building material. What they were going to do with it, I have no idea. But there must have been plenty of trees growing along the Jordan River. So they're chopping away, trees are falling, everybody's happy. And then in verse 5, everything changes. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Now, if it flew off the handle, it just didn't fall into the water. It flew off into the water. Not right at the edge, but it flew out in there somewhere. And this changed everything. Everything was going so well. Now there's a problem. Bad things happen to good people. The axe head flew off. It could have killed somebody. Did you ever have an axe head fall off, flew off? I have. You don't chop with somebody in front of you. That could happen. Or it could just fly out of your hand. But it, somebody could have got killed. But it flew out into the water. To operate the old style axe, one would have to know, as I described, how to keep the axe head firmly onto the handle. And they call that handle a helve. But anyway, now the young prophet is left with just a handle in his hand. And he said, oh no, my lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. This young guy is in a little bit of trouble now. The axe is rendered useless, and the prophet is now in debt. In those days, if you had a debt you couldn't pay, there was a judgment. There was a legal judgment against you, as there could be now. Oh no, it was borrowed. So we don't know who he borrowed it from. They were all prophets. They probably, you know, borrow, had to go borrow axes, but he would have promised to return it. If you borrow something without the promise to return it, you're actually stealing it. He didn't steal it, he just borrowed it. I'll bring it back. But now he can't bring it back because it's in the river. <laughs> and then a man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Iron doesn't float. So this was a miracle. Of course, one, one of many that God brought to happen through Elisha. And then in verse 7, lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. It must have not only floated, but it must have floated over to him because he didn't have to get in the water. Or maybe he did have to get in the water. It doesn't really say. But the axe head didn't go to work all by itself. And the young prophet still had some work to do. He's still part, he still has a part to play, but the axe head didn't, it didn't go to work all by itself. It had to have a handle to do its work. And the task now that they set upon had to be completed. So the young prophet probably had the handle in his hand. He probably took better care in fastening it onto the head and went back to work. So some of the following thoughts here I borrowed from Tony Warren for the, from the Center for Bible Theology. When I say I borrowed it, I don't have to give it back. <laughs> So he, he says the significance of the floating axe head shows that Elisha was able to do great miracles by the power of God. It also shows that God cares about his people being in debt. It shows that we should always return everything we borrow. It makes a display of the awesome power of God. But beyond that, what is the point of this particular miracle? So some questions. Why were the logs being cut near the Jordan River? 
Well, that's where they were growing. And why did Elisha cut and throw a new branch into the river to make the axe head flow? That's a good question right there. Because if he could have just thrown the old handle in there, it could have came out already on there. Why was it an axe head that was lost? See, God's miracles always have a deeper spiritual significance than just what's on the surface. The Jordan River here represents death or separation from God. The people of God had to cross the river to get to the promised land. Our promised land is heaven. We have to cross into heaven. So this represents death. Death is our, pa our, pro our pass passageway into heaven. We have to cross death. In this event, God is demonstrating to us who would come later uh, that there is a fundamental problem with the building of this house. In Psalm 127, 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. God's young prophet has a debt to pay, and that debt can only be satisfied now by the miraculous work and power of Christ to redeem or make compensation for that which was lost. The fault of the builder. All people have a debt to pay. It was impossible for the prophet to pay the debt. It's impossible for us to pay the debt that our sin incurs. Our sin is just like an axe head in the river. But Jesus, uh, I mean, just as it took the power of God to float the axe head, so that the prophet's debt could be repaid. It takes a miracle of God to pay the sin penalty that we sinners all owe and cannot pay. The same power that raised the axe head from a watery grave took our sins to the cross. The same power that raised Jesus on the third day. The same power. When the young prophet swings the axe and the head comes off, he's immediately and acutely aware that he's now beholden to the lender. In fact, he owes something he cannot repay. If he could repay that, he just would have bought his own axe or used his own axe. He wouldn't have had to borrow it, so he cannot repay this. He doesn't have an axe. If he did, he wouldn't have had to borrow one. A good axe today, I looked online, is 40 60 some of them are $90. So no wonder back then that a young prophet uh, would have to borrow the axe. Iron was costly back then. Not everybody could afford a good axe. It would have, uh, it would have been mighty generous for the lender to trust the young prophet with his axe. The young prophet must have had some character presence that caused that guy to trust him with a costly instrument like that. He probably should have given the young prophet some instructions on how to keep that head tightly on there. Apparently he didn't know how to do that or it wouldn't have flown off the handle. So here we are, standing with the young man who is subject to judgment because he cannot pay his debt. In his consternation, he cries out to Elisha, his master, who is a type of Christ. Elisha wants to know where the axe head went into the water. We need to know where our axe head went into the water. We need to recognize our sin. Where did the axe head which caused your judgment, go into the river. 
is separation. It's separated from you. It's in the river. You can't find it. And my symbolic acts had my sin, the cause of my separation, what is it? Where is it? When did it happen? What is it? What do I need to repent of? So I need to know what my sin is. He needed to know where the axe head was. So what have I done that caused, to cause this judgment? I need to cry out with the young prophet, help me Lord. I have brought judgment against myself. Then Elisha, which happens to mean God is Savior who agreed to go with these young prophets, you know, just as Jesus agreed, never to leave or forsake us is our very present help in times of trouble. But Elisha had gone with them. I will be present with you if any trouble happens. And Elisha cut a stick from the branch and throws the stick into the water. The stick represents the work of Christ on the cross to remove the curse of the law, the judgment that's against us. The Hebrew word in 2 Kings 2, 6 is translated stick. But it's the exact same word that is translated gallows in the book of Esther. Remember they, they had a gallows that, they, that Haman was hung on? So it represents the tree, a tool of hanging. Likewise, it is the same word that is translated in Deuteronomy chapter 21, where it says in verse 22, if someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole. That's the same word as the stick word. You must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it in that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. This is precisely why Christ was hung and crucified on a tree so that he would redeem his people from a debt that the law required them to pay. It shows that Christ by means of a stick, it's the same word, or a tree, has rescued us from the consequences of our debt, the curse of the law. In other words, by being made a curse for us, he has removed all our obligations to the law. Indeed, this very passage in Deuteronomy is referenced in, Gal in Galatians when it speaks about the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, 13, where it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Note that Elisha did not use the old wood in other words, the old handle of the axe, to throw into the water to retrieve that which was lost. It would have been a lot easier to use the old handle. Instead, he cut an entirely new stick from a living branch and cast it into the Jordan. This was because the stick represents the work of Christ. And it had to be untainted. It couldn't be the old stick. It was a brand new one cut from a living tree. It, had, it illustrated a new and living way of redemption. When Elisha cut off and cast this stick into the place of debt, into the water, it was only then that the iron did miraculously swim or flow to the surface of the water to be reclaimed. In 2 Kings 6, 7, he said, lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. In the King James, that says, therefore, he said, take it up to thee. And he put his hand out his hand and took it. 
So there's an action that's required. The young prophet knew where the axe had fallen into the river. I know, and better said, I know what my sin is. That's, the, that's what the Bible says, let a man examine himself. I need to recognize my sin and realize what it is doing to my relationship with God. It's separating me from God. This young prophet, having secured the blessings of God through Elisha, had to reach out and take it. He had to pick it up. It just didn't fly into his hand. It didn't reunite itself with the handle. He had to reach out and take it. Only then was his debt and the accompanying judgment satisfied. We have to come to Christ with our sin and reach out and take redemption by crying out for forgiveness and crying out that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and we receive him as Lord and Savior. God doesn't need my help to do a miracle, but he wants me to pray. He doesn't need my help to save someone, but he wants me to share the good news, the gospel with them. When you get saved, it's a miracle. Amen. It's just like a floating axe head. This guy, the young prophet, he wasn't a carpenter or even a very good woodcutter. He was probably a scholar. He didn't know how to handle tools. He wasn't equipped to do the task at hand. He was there with the rest of the prophets. I don't know how many of them were chopping. There could have been axe heads flying all over the place. I don't think they knew what they were doing. And I doubt if they knew how to build anything with those logs they were cutting down. But they had this desire to do it. He didn't know how to handle tools. This wouldn't have happened. He wasn't equipped to do the task at hand. Could have killed somebody. The whole company of prophets, they got ahead of God. They decided for themselves what to do. The place they were staying was too crowded for them. They were drawing more people. But they decided for themselves. They told Elijah or Elisha, we got to go do this. They didn't seek the guidance of God. They just asked for permission. And he said, go ahead. And they said, we need you to come with us. He said, all right, I'll come. God's always with us. But God will bring victory, always. Whatever we do should always bring glory to Him. Whatever we do. When we decide for ourselves how to do a thing, He will allow it. They decided for themselves how to do that. He will allow it, but he might not be in it because it's of our own desire, our own will and our own wishes and our own ways. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So these prophets were kind of outside of God's will because they did this of their own desire. They just did it. They just decided, we got to go do something about this and let's do it. And when we do that, we need to get God's will in what we're doing. And he might not want us to do it the way we thought is best. We might think we have it all figured. They thought they had it all figured out. They thought, well, we, we're going to do this. We're going to cut these trees down. And we're going to build a structure. But they didn't seek God. They just got permission from God's servant, from Elisha. And then they said, come with us. And he did. Well, Jesus comes with us. 
He comes with us in our folly. <laughs> and we have one folly after another, at least I do. If I don't seek God and, and then God shows a way to do something, he opens a door, and then I scratch my head and I think, is that God or is that just me? Or is that, that, That's kind of crazy doing things that way. But if it's clearly, clearly from God, then that's the way to do it. And God surprises us sometimes. The, the circuitous route for my brother to be in contact with that doctor that said, this is what your problem is. And he wasn't even a cardiologist where you're getting chest pains is because you're taking your medication wrong. You need to take it on an empty stomach. He was taking it on a full stomach before breakfast and before supper. He said that renders that medication ineffective and it's not doing you any good whatsoever. And so you might wonder, why is he going through all this? He didn't have a heart attack. They said he had a heart attack. He's going to this hospital, going to that, trying to get another hospital. He finally gets to Pittsburgh. And there's a man there that says, this is what your problem is. If he'd have got into the hospital in Erie, who knows? They would have said nothing wrong with your heart, but why are you having this? They don't know. He got an answer. Circuitous route. Crazy things happen. God does things his way. If we get in the habit of just saying, Lord, show me. Show me the way I should go. Show me. And be in a mindset to do that thing. To do what he wants us to do. To be in his will. Whether in our own sense of or our own logic or judgment, that might seem weird. But it's from God that you asked him and sought his favor. That's when you need to do that thing. You need to do it. Amen. And your axe head, your axe head will stay on the axe. <laughs> the axe head will stay on the axe if you're doing something. And, and God will prepare you and he'll give you the tool you need to do what he wants you to do in his way. Amen. The biggest, the biggest task we have is to bring people into the kingdom. Well, I know we want empty seats filled, but it, first of all, his purpose is to just get the gospel in to the sinners. And that's what we need to do. Amen. Would you stand? Lord, we thank you this morning for the awesome power, <clears throat> Lord, that you have available to us. And we ask you to forgive us for times that we just ignore your presence and your power and do things our own way. Speak to our hearts in times when we just desperately need you, Lord. Speak to our hearts. And as we go our own ways, our own separate ways today, stay with us, Lord, in your power and in your grace. Keep us close to you. And give us, uh, keep us all safe, Lord, till we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.